Tales of Terror and Mystery by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle The Beetle Hunter A curious experience, said the doctor. Yes, my friends, I have had one very curious experience. I never expect to have another, for it is against all doctrines of chances that two such events would befall any one man in a single lifetime. You may believe me or not, but the thing happened exactly as I tell it. I had just become a medical man, but I had not started in practice, and I lived in rooms in Gower Street. The street has been renumbered since then, but it was in the only house which has a bow window, upon the left-hand side as you go down from the Metropolitan Station. A widow named Murchison kept the house at that time, and she had three medical students and one engineer as lodgers. I occupied the top room, which was the cheapest, but cheap as it was, it was more than I could afford. My small resources were dwindling away, and every week it became more necessary that I should find something to do. Yet I was very unwilling to go into general practice, for my tastes were all in the direction of science, and especially of zoology, towards which I had always a strong leaning. I had almost given the fight up, and resigned myself to being a medical drudge for life, when the turning point of my struggles came in a very extraordinary way. One morning I had picked up the standard, and was glancing over its contents. There was a complete absence of news, and I was about to toss the paper down again, when my eyes were caught by an advertisement at the head of the personal column. It was worded in this way. Wanted, for one or more days, the services of a medical man. It is essential that he should be a man of strong physique, of steady nerves, and of a resolute nature. Must be an entomologist, coleopterist preferred. Apply, in person, at 77B Brook Street. Application must be made before twelve o'clock today. Now, I have already said that I was devoted to zoology. Of all branches of zoology, the study of insects was the most attractive to me, and of all insects, beetles were the species with which I was most familiar. Butterfly collectors are numerous, but beetles are far more varied and more accessible in these islands than are butterflies. It was this fact which had attracted my attention to them, and I had myself made a collection which numbered some hundred varieties. As to the other requisites of the advertisement, I knew that my nerves could be depended upon, and I had won the weight-throwing competition at the inter-hospital sports. Clearly, I was the very man for the vacancy. Within five minutes of my having read the advertisement, I was in a cab, and on my way to Brook Street. As I drove, I kept turning the matter over in my head, and trying to make a guess as to what sort of employment it could be which needed such curious qualifications. A strong physique, a resolute nature, a medical training, and a knowledge of beetles. What connection could there be between these various requisites? And then there was the disheartening fact that the situation was not a permanent one but terminable from day to day, according to the terms of the advertisement. The more I pondered over it, the more unintelligible did it become, but at the end of my meditations I always came back to the ground fact that, come what might, I had nothing to lose, that I was completely at the end of my resources, and that I was ready for any adventure, however desperate, which would put a few honest sovereigns into my pocket. The man fears to fail who has to pay for his failure, but there was no penalty which fortune could exact from me. I was like the gambler with empty pockets, who was still allowed to try his luck with the others. Number 77B, Brook Street, was one of those dingy and yet imposing houses, dun-coloured and flat-faced, with the intensely respectable and solid air which marks the Georgian builder. As I alighted from the cab, a young man came out of the door, and walked swiftly down the street. In passing me, I noticed that he cast an inquisitive and somewhat malevolent glance at me, and I took the incident as a good omen, for his appearance was that of a rejected candidate, and if he resented my application, it meant that the vacancy was not yet filled up. 
full of hope, I ascended the broad steps and rapped with a heavy knocker. A footman in powder and livery opened the door. Clearly I was in touch with the people of wealth and fashion. "'Yes, sir,' said the footman. "'I came in answer to—' "'Quite so, sir,' said the footman. "'Lord Lynchmere will see you at once in the library.' "'Lord Lynchmere. I had vaguely heard the name, but could not for the instant recall anything about him. Following the footman, I was shown into a large book-lined room, in which there was seated behind a writing-desk a small man, with a pleasant, clean-shaven, mobile face, and long hair shot with grey, brushed back from his forehead. He looked me up and down with a very shrewd, penetrating glance, holding the card which the footman had given him in his right hand. Then he smiled pleasantly, and I felt that, externally at any rate, I possessed the qualifications which he desired. "'You have come in answer to my advertisement, Dr. Hamilton,' he asked. "'Yes, sir.' "'Do you fulfil the conditions which there are laid down?' "'I believe that I do.' "'You are a powerful man, or so I should judge from your appearance. "'I think that I am fairly strong.' "'And resolute?' "'I believe so.' "'Have you ever known what it was to be exposed to imminent danger?' "'No, I don't know that I ever have.' "'But you think you would be prompt and cool at such a time?' "'I hope so.' "'Well, I believe that you would. I have the more confidence in you because you do not pretend to be certain as to what you would do in a position that was new to you. My impression is that, so far as personal qualities go, you are the very man of whom I am in search. That being settled, we may pass on to the next point.' which is to talk to me about beetles. I looked across to see if he was joking, but on the contrary, he was leaning eagerly forward across his desk, and there was an expression of something like anxiety in his eyes. "'I am afraid that you do not know about beetles,' he cried. "'On the contrary, sir. It is the one scientific subject about which I feel that I really do know something. I am overjoyed to hear it. Please talk to me about beetles. I talked. I do not profess to have said anything original upon the subject, but I gave a short sketch of the characteristics of the beetle, and ran over the more common species, with some allusions to the specimens in my own little collection and to the article upon burying beetles, which I had contributed to the Journal of Entomological Science. "'What? Not a collector?' cried Lord Lynchmere. "'You don't mean that you are yourself a collector?' His eyes danced with pleasure at the thought. "'You are certainly the very man in London for my purpose. I thought that among five millions of people there must be such a man, but the difficulty is to lay one's hands upon him. I have been extraordinarily fortunate in finding you." He rang a gong upon the table, and the footman entered. "'Ask Lady Rossiter to have the goodness to step this way,' said his lordship, and a few moments later the lady was ushered into the room. She was a small, middle-aged woman, very like Lord Lynchmere in appearance, with the same quick, alert features, and grey-black hair. The expression of anxiety, however, which I had observed upon his face, was very much more marked upon hers. Some great grief seemed to have cast its shadow over her features. As Lord Lynchmere presented me, she turned her face full upon me, and I was shocked to observe a half-heeled scar extending for two inches over her right eyebrow. It was partly concealed by plaster, but none the less I could see that it had been a serious wound, and not long inflicted. "'Dr. Hamilton is the very man for our purpose, Evelyn,' said Lord Lynchmere. "'He is actually a collector of beetles, and he has written articles upon the subject.' "'Really?' said Lady Rossiter. "'Then you must have heard of my husband. Every one who knows anything about beetles must have heard of Sir Thomas Rossiter.' For the first time a thin,
thin little ray of light began to break into the obscure business. Here at last was a connection between these people and beetles. Sir Thomas Rossiter, he was the greatest authority upon the subject in the world. He had made it his lifelong study, and had written a most exhaustive work upon it. I hastened to assure her that I had read and appreciated it. "'Have you met my husband?' she asked. "'No, I have not.' "'But you shall,' said Lord Lynchmere, with decision. The lady was standing beside the desk, and she put her hand upon his shoulder. It was obvious to me, as I saw their faces together, that they were brother and sister. "'Are you really prepared for this, Charles? It is noble of you, but you fill me with fears.' Her voice quavered with apprehension, and he appeared to me to be equally moved, though he was making strong efforts to conceal his agitation. "'Yes, yes, dear, it is all settled, it is all decided. In fact, there is no other possible way that I can see.' "'There is one obvious way.' "'No, no, Evelyn, I shall never abandon you, never. It will come right, depend upon it. It will come right. And surely it looks like the interference of Providence, that so perfect an instrument should be put into our hands. My position was embarrassing, for I felt that for the instant they had forgotten my presence. But Lord Lynchmere came back suddenly to me, and to my engagement. "'The business for which I want you, Dr. Hamilton, is that you should put yourself absolutely at my disposal. I wish you to come for a short journey with me.' to remain always at my side, and to promise to do without question whatever I may ask you, however unreasonable it may appear to you to be." "'That is a good deal to ask,' said I. "'Unfortunately I cannot put it more plainly, for I do not myself know what turn matters may take. You may be sure, however, that you will not be asked to do anything which your conscience does not approve, and I promise you that, when all is over, you will be proud to have been concerned in so good a work." "'If it ends happily,' said the lady. "'Exactly. If it ends happily,' his lordship repeated. "'And terms?' I asked. Twenty pounds a day. I was amazed at the sum, and must have showed my surprise upon my features. It is a rare combination of qualities, as must have struck you when you first read the advertisement," said Lord Lynchmere. Such varied gifts may well command a high return, and I do not conceal from you that your duties may be arduous, or even dangerous. Besides, it is possible that one or two days may bring the matter to an end." "'Please God,' sighed his sister. "'So now, Dr. Hamilton. May I rely upon your aid?" "'Most undoubtedly,' said I. "'You have only to tell me what my duties are.' "'Your first duty will be to return to your home. You will pack up whatever you may need for a short visit to the country. We start together from Paddington Station at three-forty this afternoon.' "'Do we go far?' "'As far as Pangbourne. Meet me at the bookstall at three-thirty. I shall have the tickets.' Good-bye, Dr. Hamilton. And, by the way, there are two things which I should be very glad if you would bring with you, in case you have them. One is your case for collecting beetles, and the other is a stick, and the thicker and heavier the better." You may imagine that I had plenty to think of, from the time that I left Brook Street until I set out to meet Lord Lynchmere at Paddington. The whole fantastic business kept arranging and rearranging itself in kaleidoscope forms inside my brain, until I had thought out a dozen explanations, each of them more grotesquely improbable than the last. And yet I felt that the truth must be something grotesquely improbable also. At last I gave up all attempts at finding a solution, and contented myself with exactly carrying out the instructions which I had received. With a hand valise, specimen case, and a loaded cane, I was waiting at the Paddington bookstall when Lord Lynchmere arrived. He was an even smaller man than I had thought, frail 
and peaky, with a manner which was more nervous than it had been in the morning. He wore a long, thick, travelling ulster, and I observed that he carried a heavy blackthorn cudgel in his hand. "'I have the tickets,' said he, leading the way up the platform. "'This is our train. I have engaged a carriage, for I am particularly anxious to impress one or two things upon you while we travel down.' And yet, all that he had to impress upon me might have been said in a sentence, for it was that I was to remember that I was there as a protection to himself, and that I was not, on any consideration, to leave him for an instant. This he repeated again and again, as our journey drew to a close, with an insistence which showed that his nerves were thoroughly shaken. "'Yes,' he said at last, in answer to my looks rather than to my words. "'I am nervous, Dr. Hamilton. I have always been a timid man, and my timidity depends upon my frail physical health. But my soul is firm, and I can bring myself up to face a danger which a less nervous man might shrink from. What I am doing now is done from no compulsion, but entirely from a sense of duty. And yet it is beyond doubt a desperate risk. If things should go wrong, I will have some claims to the title of martyr." This eternal reading of riddles was too much for me. I felt that I must put a term to it. "'I think it would be very much better, sir, if you were to trust me entirely,' said I. "'It is impossible for me to act effectively, when I do not know what are the objects which we have in view, or even where we are going.' "'Oh, as to where we are going, there need be no mystery about that,' said he. "'We are going to Delamere Court, the residence of Sir Thomas Rossiter, with whose work you are so conversant.' As to the exact object of our visit, I do not know that at this stage of the proceedings anything would be gained, Dr. Hamilton, by taking you into my complete confidence. I may tell you that we are acting. I say we, because my sister Lady Rossiter takes the same view as myself, with the one object of preventing anything in the nature of a family scandal. That being so, you can understand that I am loath to give any explanations which are not absolutely necessary. It would be a different matter, Dr. Hamilton, if I were asking your advice. As matters stand, it is only your active help which I need, and I will indicate to you, from time to time, how you can best give it." There was nothing more to be said, and a poor man can put up with a good deal for twenty pounds a day, but I felt, none the less, that Lord Lynchmere was acting rather scurvily towards me. He wished to convert me into a passive tool, like the blackthorn in his hand. With his sensitive disposition I could imagine, however, that scandal would be abhorrent to him, and I realised that he would not take me into his confidence until no other course was open to him. I must trust to my own eyes and ears to solve the mystery, but I had every confidence that I should not trust to them in vain. Delamere Court lies a good five miles from Pangbourne Station, and we drove for that distance in an open fly. Lord Lynchmere sat in deep thought during the time, and he never opened his mouth until we were close to our destination. When he did speak, it was to give me a piece of information which surprised me. "'Perhaps you are not aware,' said he, "'that I am a medical man like yourself.' "'No, sir. I did not know it.' "'Yes. I qualified in my younger days, when there were several lives between me and the peerage. I have not had occasion to practice, but I have found it a useful education all the same. I never regretted the years which I devoted to medical study. These are the gates of Delamere Court.' We had come to two high pillars, crowned with heraldic monsters, which flanked the opening of a winding avenue. Over the laurel bushes and rhododendrons I could see a long, many-gabled mansion, girdled with ivy, and toned to the warm, cheery, mellow glow of old brickwork. My eyes were still fixed in admiration upon this delightful house, when my companion plucked nervously at my sleeve. "'Here's Sir Thomas,' he whispered. "'Please talk beetle all you can.' 
a tall, thin figure, curiously angular and bony, had emerged through a gap in the hedge of laurels. In his hand he held a spud, and he wore gauntleted gardener's gloves. A broad-brimmed, grey hat cast his face into shadow, but it struck me as exceedingly austere, with an ill-nourished beard and harsh, irregular features. The fly pulled up, and Lord Lynchmere sprang out. "'My dear Thomas, how are you?' said he heartily. But the heartiness was by no means reciprocal. The owner of the grounds glared at me over his brother-in-law's shoulder, and I caught broken scraps of sentences. Well-known wishes, hatred of strangers, unjustifiable intrusion, perfectly inexcusable. Then there was a muttered explanation, and the two of them came over together to the side of the fly. "'Let me present you to Sir Thomas Rossiter, Dr. Hamilton,' said Lord Lynchmere. "'You will find that you have a strong community of tastes.' I bowed. Sir Thomas stood very stiffly, looking at me severely from under the broad brim of his hat. "'Lord Lynchmere tells me that you know something about beetles,' said he. "'What do you know about beetles?' "'I know what I have learned from your work upon the Coleoptera, Sir Thomas,' I answered. "'Give me the names of the better-known species of the British Scarabai,' said he. I had not expected an examination, but fortunately I was ready for one. My answers seemed to please him, for his stern features relaxed. "'You appear to have read my book with some profit, sir,' said he. It is a rare thing for me to meet any one who takes an intelligent interest in such matters. People can find time for such trivialities as sport, or society, and yet the beetles are overlooked. I can assure you that the greater part of the idiots in this part of the country are unaware that I have ever written a book at all. I, the first man who ever described the true function of the Elytria. I am glad to see you, sir and I have no doubt that I can show you some specimens that will interest you." He stepped into the fly, and drove with us up to the house, expounding to me as we went some recent researches which he had made into the anatomy of the ladybird. I have said that Sir Thomas Rossiter wore a large hat drawn down over his brows. As he entered the hall he uncovered himself, and I was at once aware of a singular characteristic which the hat had concealed. His forehead, which was naturally high, and higher still on account of receding hair, was in a continual state of movement. Some nervous weakness kept the muscles in a constant spasm, which sometimes produced a mere twitching, and sometimes a curious rotary movement, unlike anything which I had seen before. It was strikingly visible as he turned towards us after entering the study and seemed the more singular, from the contrast with the hard, steady grey eyes, which looked out from underneath those palpitating brows. "'I am sorry,' said he, "'that Lady Rossiter is not here to help me welcome you. By the way, Charles, did Evelyn say anything about the date of her return?' "'She wished to stay in town for a few more days,' said Lord Lynchmere. You know how ladies' social duties accumulate if they have been for some time in the country. My sister has many old friends in London at present. Well, she is her own mistress, and I should not wish to alter her plans, but I shall be glad when I see her again. It is very lonely here without her company. I was afraid that you might find it so, and that was partly why I ran down. My young friend, Dr. Hamilton, is so much interested in the subject which you have made your own, that I thought you would not mind his accompanying me. I lead a retired life, Dr. Hamilton, and my aversion to strangers grows upon me," said our host. I have sometimes thought that my nerves are not as good as they were. My travels in search of beetles in my younger days took me into many malarious and unhealthy places. But a brother coleopterist like yourself is always a welcome guest and I shall be delighted if you will look over my collection, which I think that I may, without exaggeration, describe as the best in Europe." And so, no doubt, it was. He had a huge oaken cabinet, 
arranged in shallow drawers, and here, neatly ticketed and classified, were beetles from every corner of the earth, black, brown, blue, green, and mottled. Every now and then, as he swept his hand over the lines and lines of impaled insects, he would catch up some rare specimen, and, handling it with as much delicacy and reverence as if it were a precious relic, he would hold forth upon its peculiarities and the circumstances under which it came into his possession. It was evidently an unusual thing for him to meet with a sympathetic listener, and he talked and talked till the spring evening had deepened into night, and the gong announced that it was time to dress for dinner. All the time Lord Lynchmere said nothing, but he stood at his brother-in-law's elbow, and I caught him continually shooting curious little questioning glances into his face. And his own features expressed some strong emotion, apprehension, sympathy, expectation. I seemed to read them all. I was sure that Lord Lynchmere was fearing something, and awaiting something, but what that something might be I could not imagine. The evening passed quietly, but pleasantly, and I should have been entirely at my ease if it had not been for that continual sense of tension upon the part of Lord Lynchmere. As to our host, I found that he improved upon acquaintance. He spoke constantly with affection of his absent wife, and also of his little son, who had recently been sent to school. The house, he said, was not the same without them. If it were not for his scientific studies, he did not know how he could get through the days. After dinner we smoked for some time in the billiard-room, and finally went early to bed. And then it was that for the first time the suspicion that Lord Lynchmere was a lunatic crossed my mind. He followed me into my bedroom, when our host had retired. "'Doctor,' said he, speaking in a low, hurried voice, "'you must come with me. You must spend the night in my bedroom.' "'What do you mean?' "'I prefer not to explain, but this is part of your duties. My room is close by, and you can return to your own before the servant calls you in the morning.' "'But why?' I asked. "'Because I am nervous of being alone,' said he. "'That's the reason, since you must have a reason.' It seemed rank lunacy, but the argument of those twenty pounds would overcome many objections. I followed him to his room. "'Well,' said I, "'there's only room for one in that bed.' "'Only one shall occupy it,' said he. And the other? Must remain on watch. Why? said I. One would think you expected to be attacked. Perhaps I do. In that case, why not lock your door? Perhaps I want to be attacked. It looked more and more like lunacy. However, there was nothing for it but to submit. I shrugged my shoulders and sat down in the armchair beside the empty fireplace. "'I am to remain on watch, then,' said I, ruefully. "'We will divide the night. If you will watch until two, I will watch the remainder.' "'Very good. Call me at two o'clock, then. I will do so. Keep your ears open, and if you hear any sounds, wake me instantly. Instantly, you hear?' You can rely upon it. I tried to look as solemn as he did. And for God's sake don't go to sleep, said he. And so, taking off only his coat, he threw the coverlet over him and settled down for the night. It was a melancholy vigil, and made more so by my own sense of its folly. Supposing that by any chance Lord Lynchmere had cause to suspect that he was subject to danger in the house of Sir Thomas Rossiter, why on earth could he not lock his door and so protect himself? His own answer, that he might wish to be attacked, was absurd. Why should he possibly wish to be attacked? And who would wish to attack him? Clearly, Lord Lynchmere was suffering from some singular delusion, and the result was that on an imbecile pretext I was to be deprived of my night's rest. 
Still, however absurd, I was determined to carry out his injunctions to the letter, as long as I was in his employment. I sat, therefore, beside the empty fireplace, and listened to a sonorous chiming clock somewhere down the passage, which gurgled and struck every quarter of an hour. It was an endless vigil. Save for that single clock, an absolute silence reigned throughout the great house. A small lamp stood on a table at my elbow, throwing a circle of light round my chair, but leaving the corners of the room draped in shadow. On the bed, Lord Lynchmere was breathing peacefully. I envied him his quiet sleep, and again and again my own eyelids drooped, but every time my sense of duty came to my help, and I sat up, rubbing my eyes, and pinching myself with a determination to see my irrational watch to an end. And I did so. From down the passage came the chimes of two o'clock, and I laid my hand upon the shoulder of the sleeper. Instantly he was sitting up, with an expression of the keenest interest upon his face. "'You have heard something?' "'No, sir. It is two o'clock.' "'Very good. I will watch. You can go to sleep.' I lay down under the coverlet as he had done, and was soon unconscious. My last recollection was of that circle of lamplight, and of the small hunched-up figure and strained, anxious face of Lord Lynchmere in the centre of it. How long I slept I do not know, but I was suddenly aroused by a sharp tug at my sleeve. The room was in darkness, but a hot smell of oil told me that the lamp had only that instant been extinguished. Quick. Quick, said Lord Lynchmere's voice in my ear. I sprang out of bed. He's still dragging at my arm. Over here, he whispered, and pulled me into a corner of the room. Hush, listen. In the silence of the night, I could distinctly hear that someone was coming down the corridor. It was a stealthy step, faint and intermittent as of a man who paused cautiously after every stride. Sometimes for half a minute there was no sound, and then came the shuffle and creak which told of a fresh advance. My companion was trembling with excitement. His hand, which still held my sleeve, twitched like a branch in the wind. "'What is it?' I whispered. "'It's he.' "'Sir Thomas?' Yes. What does he want? Hush. Do nothing until I tell you. I was conscious now that someone was trying the door. There was the faintest little rattle from the handle, and then I dimly saw a thin slit of subdued light. There was a lamp burning somewhere far down the passage, and it just sufficed to make the outside visible from the darkness of our room. The greyish slit grew broader and broader, very gradually, very gently, and then, outlined against it, I saw the dark figure of a man. He was squat and crouching, with the silhouette of a bulky and misshapen dwarf. Slowly the door swung open, with this ominous shape framed in the centre of it. And then, in an instant, the crouching figure shot up, there was a tiger spring across the room, and thud, 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 came three tremendous blows from some heavy object upon the bed. I was so paralysed with amazement that I stood motionless and staring, until I was aroused by a yell for help from my companion. The open light shed enough light for me to see the outline of things, and there was little Lord Lynchmere, with his arms around the neck of his brother-in-law, holding bravely on to him like a game bull-terrier, with its teeth into a gaunt deer-hound. The tall, bony man dashed himself about, writhing round and round to get a grip upon his assailant. But the other, clutching on from behind, still kept his hold, though his shrill, frightened cries showed how unequal he felt the contest to be. I sprang to the rescue, and the two of us managed to throw Sir Thomas to the ground, though he made his teeth meet in my shoulder. With all my youth and weight and strength, 
It was a desperate struggle before we could master his frenzied struggles. But at last we secured his arms with the waist-cord of the dressing-gown which he was wearing. I was holding his legs, while Lord Lynchmere was endeavouring to relight the lamp, when there came the pattering of many feet in the passage, and the butler, and two footmen, who had been alarmed by the cries, rushed into the room. With their aid we had no further difficulty in securing our prisoner who lay foaming and glaring upon the ground. One glance at his face was enough to prove that he was a dangerous maniac, while the short, heavy hammer, which lay beside the bed, showed how murderous had been his intentions. "'Do not use any violence,' said Lord Lynchmere, as we raised the struggling man to his feet. "'He will have a period of stupor after this excitement. I believe that it is coming on already.' As he spoke, the convulsions became less violent, and the madman's head fell forward upon his breast, as if he were overcome by sleep. We led him down the passage, and stretched him upon his own bed, where he lay unconscious, breathing heavily. Two of you will watch him,' said Lord Lynchmere. "'And now, Dr. Hamilton, if you will return with me to my room, I will give you the explanation which my horror of scandal has perhaps caused me to delay too long. Come what may, you will never have cause to regret your share in this night's work. The case may be made clear in a very few words, he continued, when we were alone. My poor brother-in-law is one of the best fellows upon earth, a loving husband and an esteemable father, but he comes from a stock which is deeply tainted with insanity. He has more than once had homicidal outbreaks, which are the more painful because his inclination is always to attack the very person to whom he is most attached. His son was sent away to school to avoid this danger, and then came an attempt upon my sister, his wife, from which she escaped with injuries that you may have observed when you met her in London. You understand that he knows nothing of the matter when he is in his sound senses, and would ridicule the suggestion that he could— under any circumstances, injure those whom he loves so dearly. It is often, as you know, a characteristic of such maladies, that it is absolutely impossible to convince the man who suffers from them of their existence. Our great object was, of course, to get him under restraint, before he could stain his hands with blood, but the matter was full of difficulty. He is a recluse in his habits, and would not see any medical man— Besides, it was necessary for our purpose that the medical man should convince himself of his insanity, and he is as sane as you or I, save on these very rare occasions. But fortunately, before he has these attacks, he always shows certain premonitory symptoms, which are providential danger signals, warning us to be upon our guard. The chief of these is that nervous contortion of the forehead which you must have observed— this is a phenomenon which always appears from three to four days before his attacks of frenzy. The moment it showed itself, his wife came into town on some pretext, and took refuge in my house in Brook Street. It remained for me to convince a medical man of Sir Thomas's insanity, without which it was impossible to put him where he could do no harm. The first problem was how to get a medical man into his house— I bethought me of his interest in beetles, and his love for any one who shared his tastes. I advertised, therefore, and was fortunate enough to find in you the very man I wanted. A stout companion was necessary, for I knew that the lunacy could only be proved by a murderous assault, and I had every reason to believe that that assault would be made upon myself, since he had the warmest regard for me in his moments of sanity. I think your intelligence will supply all the rest." I did not know that the attack would come by night. But I thought it very probable, for the crises of such cases do usually occur in the early hours of the morning. I am a very nervous man myself, but I saw no other way in which I could remove this terrible danger from my sister's life. I need not ask you whether you are willing to sign the lunacy papers. Undoubtedly, but two signatures are necessary. You forget that I am myself a holder of a medical degree. 
I have the papers on a side table here, so if you will be good enough to sign them now, we can have the patient removed in the morning. So that was my visit to Sir Thomas Rossiter, the famous beetle-hunter, and that was also my first step upon the ladder of success, for Lady Rossiter and Lord Lynchmere have proved to be staunch friends, and they have never forgotten my association with them in their time of need. Sir Thomas is out, and said to be cured, but I still think that if I spent another night at Delamere Court, I should be inclined to lock my door upon the inside. End of the Beetle Hunter <laughs>